Hello everyone and welcome to the latest CMS Pensions Team Lawcast. Today we're going to be looking at the discretionary distribution of death benefits. So this Lawcast is aimed at providing trustees with some key points to think about when going through the decision making process. It's about how you can exercise your discretion safely to pay out benefits, for example lump sum of pension benefits. There will of course be other points to consider, for example tax consequences, so we've been quite careful to try to scope this lawcast to the key practical points you must consider. I'm joined in this case by Chris Ransom and Doyen Olubemiga. We're going to be going through five top points to consider in trustee discretionary death benefit cases. We're going to give you some examples too, which should hopefully help put these points into context. Thanks, Alistair. We thought it would be useful to first start by mentioning the basic principles of trustee decision making. And we're sure everyone is aware of this, but it's always useful to lay the foundations. There is, after all, a statutory duty under the Pensions Act 2004 for trustees to be conversant with the scheme's documents. So it's important to always check the scheme's trustee and rules to understand whether there is even a decision to be made. In other words, where a member passes away, is there a payment required to be made by the scheme rules? If so, is it discretionary? And what conditions, if any, apply? So moving on to our top five tips in discretionary death cases, the first point to think about before any decision is taken is considering the list of potential beneficiaries, as the benefit can only be paid to someone who falls within that class permitted by the scheme's rules. Equal consideration should also be given to all potential beneficiaries that fall within that class. Now this will vary from scheme to scheme, but it will often include any spouse, civil partners, financial dependents and children. The scheme rules may go wider and in some cases include charities, so it's really important to understand who is in scope for a death benefit from the outset and it helps to make sure you haven't spent time considering someone that actually isn't entitled to a death benefit at all. Or alternatively, not considered someone who should have been considered. It's also important to bear in mind that were the trustees to pay a benefit to someone not entitled to it under the rules, the trustees would be acting in breach of trust. The second point is to understand that the trustees do not have to leave all stones unturned and many need to make reasonable inquiries. There are also standard documents such as a will or expression of wish form, which will help to inform the trustee's understanding of the member's own wishes. And sometimes the individuals contained in these can be quite surprising. For example, a love child or a mistress may be named, as the member may know that they won't be around to deal with the consequences. So the starting point is to follow these documents, unless there's a good reason not to, but it's very important to remember that they are not binding on the trustees. Of course, it's also important to ask the standard administrators questions. However, there is no obligation on the trustee to try and find out every potential beneficiary in that deceased member's life. We've seen in the past, if a trustee has that approach, then it actually stops them from making a decision in a timely manner for the potential beneficiaries, which is in no one's interest. And we do have to often remind trustees that they are only obliged to carefully consider the information before them and don't have to search for every detail. As this tends to only hinder decision making instead of help and may lead to complaints from beneficiaries. Where there is uncertainty, however, trustees will need to take a view and rely on the documents in front of them. After all, it's more difficult to challenge a decision where a reasonable approach has been taken. If there is some doubt, therefore, as to whether someone falls within the name class, the safe approach is always to err on the side of caution and assume they don't, because to pay someone who's not within the class of beneficiaries would be a breach of trust, as already mentioned. We should also mention that trustees need to consider how much weight that should be given to nomination forms. As I've already said, nomination forms give a good indication of members' wishes, but they're not binding. Consideration also needs to be given as to whether the forms themselves have been kept up to date by the member. And it's always helpful to remind members periodically to keep these up to date as far as possible, a reminder in the scheme's annual newsletter, for example. While nomination forms should be kept up to date, invariably they aren't. It's however equally important to give due consideration to those named in them still before making the final decision, even if the trustees decide ultimately to distribute the death benefit to someone else. An example of how the Ombudsman expects nomination forms to be approached, including the weight to be given to them, is the case of McNee in September 2014. In 2005, Miss McNee completed a nomination form in favour of her parents. In 2009, Miss McNee had a son and made a revised will. In April 2010, she further updated this, providing for her residuary estate to be held on trust for the son to his 30th birthday. Miss McNee, however, died in September 2011. The trustees made a decision to pay the death benefit to Miss McNee's estate. Her parents, however, complained to the pensions ombudsman, and their complaint was upheld. 
The Ombudsman considered that whilst the trustees were not bound by the nomination form, they should have taken appropriate steps to consider the parents still as potential recipients. The trustees' position, however, was that they considered there had been significant change in Ms McNeese's circumstances since completion of the form, namely the birth of a son and the revised will. The decision was nevertheless remitted back to the trustees to reconsider their original decision and to ensure that the due consideration was given to the parents because they were named on the nomination form. Now I'll now hand over to Doyen. Thanks, Chris. The third point to consider is to ensure that the potential beneficiaries' expectations have been properly managed. The decision maker should be mindful of the fact that this will be a highly emotive time for the potential beneficiaries and they've usually lost a loved one or a member of the family. The key is to ensure that expectations are not set regarding the form of benefit that will be paid, but to confirm that the trustees are considering what benefits are payable and who might potentially benefit, but no more than that. If expectations that benefit will be paid are set, and subsequently pay to someone else, then trustees are likely to receive a complaint from that member. You must remember that potential beneficiaries can bring complaints under the scheme's IDRP. Even if they have had no entitlement, if the complaint proceeds to the Pension Ombudsman Office, he can still award them for a sum for non-financial injustice or maladministration on behalf of the trustee. It is also important not to specify the amount of benefits payable to the potential beneficiaries. The obvious reason being is that if an amount is mentioned, it raises the level of expectation and if ultimately the decision maker decides to pay a lesser amount to a potential beneficiary or to pay someone else entirely, that disappointment is more likely to make that person raise a complaint. Moving on to the fourth point to consider is that it's important to always consider the pensions ombudsman entirely. As previously mentioned, potential beneficiaries are also able to make a complaint. So points that would be useful to consider here are things such as making sure you involve the potential beneficiaries early on in the process and obtaining relevant information from them all. And also communicating sensitively. For example, it may be more appropriate to amend your standard letters to make them more personal as they are less likely to complain about the way the process has been handled. It's also important to carefully consider how trustee minutes and memos are drafted and Alistair will talk a bit later about how to best record decisions taken. In particularly contentious cases, you could also think about sharing information anonymously with beneficiaries and asking if there is anything missing or even giving notice of a provisional decision. However, we wouldn't recommend this in other circumstances. Challenges to the exercise of a discretion are inevitable, but I'm happy to say that the courts and the pension ombudsman generally won't interfere with trustees' decisions, and they don't tend to impose their own view where that decision has been arrived following a proper process. But there are some general principles that enable disappointed members to attack decisions, so it's best to be aware of these also. If trustees keep these in mind, it should help to avoid challenges and resulting criticism from the pensions ombudsman. So trustees should ensure that the decision is being made by the right person. For example, consideration should be made as to whether the decision maker has been correctly delegated to the exercise of that discretion and whether the correct person or committee has made the decision. Trustees should also ensure that their general decision making processes are correct by ensuring any meeting held to come to that decision was quiet and whether a delegated authority was used appropriately. Another point that trustees should consider is whether the decision maker considered all the relevant factors and disregarded all the relevant factors. Also consider whether reasonable inquiries were made for that to occur. Again, it's also important to ensure that personal views don't influence a decision, for example, moral and political views. A good example of this might be if someone disapproved strongly of cohabitation um, and allowed that to influence their decision. Another good point for trustees to consider is whether the discretionary power was used for an improper purpose, as all, as all powers should be used for their proper purpose. So an example of that is the, the courts have ruled in the case of courage against the use of a merger power to transfer members out of the scheme with a surplus. So that surplus could be used to, pay, to be paid back to the employer on wind up. Um, another example is that in 2018, the Court of Appeal held in the British Airways case that the trustee's role was to manage and administer the scheme. It could not exercise its amendment powers to set rather than deliver the deferred remuneration of current and former BA employees. It's important to also think about whether the decision taken is an irrational decision that no reasonable trustee could have taken.
If it does get to a point where a potential beneficiary complains, it's important to set out your arguments clearly under the IDRP complaint procedure, as these will assist with your arguments if the matter escalates to the pension ombudsman. Remember, this is a processed focused, not outcome focused procedure. So as long as trustees have undertaken a clear procedure, checked all the relevant facts and disregarded the relevant information, ensured who fell into the class of potential beneficiaries and made reasonable inquiries, it will be hard for the decision to be challenged. I'll now hand over to Alistair, who is going to talk through the last point for trustees to consider. Well, thanks, Doyen. And the fifth and last tip, of course, is to think about how you want to record decisions that are taken. Now, this relates in a way to the last point that Doyne's just made, because you want to make sure that if a complaint is ever made to the pensions ombudsman, you're in a position to disclose adequate records of the decision that you took. Some points to consider here are, firstly, you're not required to record all reasons for decisions or to disclose those reasons to the beneficiaries. The courts have previously held that in the absence of any evidence of impropriety, for example, inappropriate behaviour, there's no obligation for trustees to disclose their reasoning. The pensions ombudsman, however, has qualified this by saying that a blanket refusal to provide reasoning is simply unacceptable. Privacy or confidentiality are, generally speaking, OK, but otherwise reasons for decisions should be disclosed. The pensions ombudsman has been known in the past to award relatively small amounts for distress and inconvenience over refusals to disclose reasoning. What we would say is that minutes and memos relating to the exercise of a discretionary death benefit case should be carefully drafted. Uh, you do need to show the relevant considerations have been taken into account um, and it's preferable to record the actual decision making process and the weight given to the various factors whilst remaining sensitive to the case itself. The trustees should write minutes on the basis that they would be disclosable in the event of litigation. And that brings us to the end of the substantive part of this presentation. Thanks very much for joining us for this lawcast. We all hope that you found it very interesting and useful. Join us again for the next one, which will focus on overpayments. If you've got any questions, though, please don't hesitate to send them to us by email. Thanks very much for watching and listening. Mm -hmm.